Good evening. This afternoon, we're with Christina Fries, who's a speech pathologist and a certified brain injury specialist. Christina holds a Master's of Science from Columbia in speech and language pathology. And in addition to um, speech and language pathology, she is a, um, a traumatic brain injury expert. Um, she got uh, clinical fellowship at the Brady Institute of Traumatic Brain Injury. And um, so she, I'm pleased that she's here because clearly um, a stroke is a, is a brain injury, but uh, other people who listen to this uh, may have had TBIs. Um, in addition to a whole bunch of uh, really excellent, uh, excellent things in her background, she is uh, in, uh, in Florida. She's part of, she's head of the uh, Cuyahoga County Medical Society Alliance, and she's author of uh, Cognitive Implications of Dementia, a Caregiver's Guide, which is really important to maximize communication and swallow function. And you know, with, with all of these injuries, a caregiver is really an important part of the, of the mix. Um, certainly in my case, um, I wasn't doing any much thinking and my caregiver was very important and that's the same with uh, almost everybody else in, uh, in brain injuries. So, Christina, welcome. Thank you and, for having me. And uh, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about some common changes in speech after a stroke. I'd love to. Thank you so Great. much for having me. So there's two common changes in speech after a stroke that we usually see. One is called dysarthria, which is caused by muscle weakness, and the other is called apraxia, which is caused by a motor planning impairment. Um, dysarthria usually sounds like slurred speech right. um, due to weakness in the tongue or the lips mm -hmm. and the face. People often speak very slowly, some speak quickly. It can range from mild all the way to very severe where at the single word level, right. you know, you're barely intelligible. Um, apraxia though is very different. It's um, inconsistent. So there's a disconnect in the brain's ability to plan from the brain to the mouth and the tongue. Um, someone might have fluent, intelligible speech and then the inability to produce speech. So like we said, very mm -hmm. inconsistent. Right. You might have difficulty imitating sounds, but you could produce automatic sequences very easily, such as counting or I'm fine, how are you, things right. like that. So a speech language pathologist can conduct a thorough evaluation to determine the type and the severity of your disorder. Right. See, I had, the, the first of these, dyslexia, um, initially. Dysarthria. They thought yeah. dysarthria, right? Yeah. Well, they didn't use that. Well, maybe they did use that word, but I can't remember. Yeah. But I couldn't speak at the beginning, and then I started to slur my words. Um, and I still slur them after I drink. <laughs> I think most people do. Oh, well, it may be. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> anyway, I've been fortunate enough to get most of that back, but um, th that's very interesting. So. When, when a speech language pathologist does this evaluation, what is a patient likely to um, experience during that? Uh... Yeah, so the evaluation, it's thorough, but you know, it's nothing to be scared or worried. Right. Um, the speech pathologist will be listening to all aspects of your speech, vowels, consonants. If you can produce sentences, mm -hmm. you might only be able to produce phrases or words. Right. Different combinations of syllables, right consonants and vowels in different patterns right. to see how they sound yes. and of course your voice your right. respirations things right. like see, that. when i was in a nursing home and i had that and they gave me three words to say and i couldn't say it yeah and that's kind of when i realized i was uh, in more trouble than i thought yeah. i was in so anyway what can a person who's had a stroke do to treat these speech disorders yeah, and you know like we said first it's important to have an evaluation mm -hmm. right by a trained right. professional because there are six different types of dysarthria um, so the treatment really does vary dependent upon the type 
Um, and the treatment for a dysarthria is very different from the treatment of apraxia. Right. So there's really not one blanket statement that would kind of treat everything. But in general, if you have dysarthria, which is usually the slurred type of speech, um, it's beneficial to slow down your speech. Um, take a deep breath before you speak so you're loud enough for everyone to hear. Um, Over-exaggerate and over-articulate each and every phoneme or word in a sentence so people can really hear the distinct right. sounds. Right. Um, for apraxia, it's a little bit different. Um, there's more drills involved in apraxia, mm -hmm. drill-like repetition of certain patterns of combinations of consonants and vowels. Um, a therapist might teach you different types of cues for touch and tapping. Mm -hmm. um, they'll help pace you a little bit to help control your rhythm of your More speech. like exercise. Yeah, it's a little bit different, the treatment for apraxia right. versus dysarthria. Right. And that's why it's important to have a professional sure. really determine what, for sure. what the disorder for sure. actually is. Absolutely. Yeah, And it's important you know, to really control your environment, mm -hmm. whether it's dysarthria or apraxia. You know your strongest time of day, right. when your voice and your speech sound the best. You want to limit distractions in mm -hmm. the environment, noises or visual distractions. You want to have good lighting, right. sit face to face with your communication partner. Right. That's really the optimal environment right. for anyone. Typical morning is better because it's the morning? Or? Usually for most people, the morning hours are their best hours. And as the day goes on, they tend to fatigue with about four right. or five o'clock being, you know, their right. time of significant right. fatigue. But some people in the morning, they're not great because they're a little drowsy still. But mm -hmm. if you think about late morning, like 10.30, mm -hmm. 11.30, for most people, that's a really right. good time. Would naps affect some of this? Yeah, a nap can help um, quite a bit just mm -hmm. to re-energize sure. you a bit. Um, right. So, you know, that's definitely, if you know you have a call coming in, a conference mm -hmm. call or something at 4 o'clock, you want to take a little cat nap before. Right. But, you know, it's really important just to be well-rested for optimal voice, speech, right. production. Right. Why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, some common changes in language after a stroke? So language um, is very interesting, you know, in terms of neurological components to strokes. And language is predominantly housed in the left side of the brain for right-handed individuals. Um, so a stroke damaging the left side of the brain would result in a disorder called aphasia. And aphasia may make it challenging for you to understand incoming information. And it may also be challenging for you to read or write or express yourself verbally. Um, it does not have anything to do with intelligence. It does not have anything to do with memory, which I think is very important right. to understand. Right. Um, so for example, if you were attempting to verbalize the word for spoon, um, you know, someone might say fork instead of spoon, oh, substitute right. that, substitute, right. or poon, or even couch or chair, you know, right, a completely right, unrelated right, word. Right. And that's pretty characteristic for an expressive aphasia where you might make up words or you might combine made up words with actual words. Right. Um, so this is um, seen quite a bit after mm -hmm. a left hand, a left sided um, stroke. stroke. Also, if someone asked you to point to the ceiling or to point to the floor and you could not produce um, those commands in sequence in that order, it would be characteristic of a receptive aphasia. So there's disorders of understanding and then disorders of verbalization, a right. little bit different there. And this can be mild where someone maybe once in a while right. has a period of mm -hmm. you know, difficulty word finding. Right literally, you right. know, once every few conversations, right. or it can be very severe where the individual can't verbalize at the single word level, mm -hmm. or maybe can't follow basic one-step commands right. like open your eyes, open your eyes. close sure. your eyes, you know, sure. um, or even answer yes or no questions. Right. So it's important to have a thorough evaluation by a speech language right. pathologist to really pinpoint what type of severity um, of aphasia that you are experiencing. Right. Is it receptive? Is it expressive? Is it mild? Is it severe? Because that really will help determine the treatment plan. Right, right, interesting. So, you know, I didn't realize that reading was aphasia also, besides speech. Yeah, 
Yeah, and it's interesting, reading and writing. Mm -hmm. So some people verbally can perform within normal limits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can show them different objects, give them different word-finding exercises, and they can perform it with 100% accuracy. Mm -hmm. But if I were to give them a sentence, that individual might have difficulty reading it aloud or uh, comprehension of right. a paragraph. So if I were to give someone a paragraph, a lengthy paragraph, and ask them to answer questions subsequent to the paragraph, the individual might not be able to do right. that. And he or she may have been an avid reader, mm -hmm. you know, in the past. Right. So we can definitely right. see difficulties in reading, absolutely, right. associated so, with language disorders. See, initially I couldn't, if you gave me a sentence, I couldn't do it. No way. Wow. Couldn't do that. And I couldn't even do three more than three or four words. Yeah. Initially. Then if I had to do, it took a lot, quite a long time for me to be able to speak or read, you know, a paragraph, for example. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's very challenging. Right, um, it is a challenging thing for people. It's very frustrating because they they have the intelligence and they maintain have maintained it, but they uh, have trouble communicating, and so that is a, a big frustration for oh, people. Absolutely, and I think that the biggest challenge is because you do have the intelligence. Right. Right. You that's know. Exactly right. I mean, that's where it becomes so frustrating, frustrating. because you're highly aware. Right, you're aware of your deficiency. Exactly. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So what can a person who has had a stroke do to treat aphasia? What do you suggest? Well, you know, obviously seeing a speech pathologist is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the home, what you can do to help yourself a little bit is really try to surround yourself with excellent communication partners, if you can. Right. Um, your caregivers. Mm -hmm. Really, communication is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. It's really not just about speaking, okay? Mm -hmm. It's about listening, right. and it's about having someone who can do both with you, someone right. who can speak with you right. and listen to you. Um, so, you know, we tend to place a great importance on the speaker all the time in communication, right. but actually it's equally as important sure. to have a quality listener. Right. Um, so your communication partner should speak slowly, um, allow you time, to find your words. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want someone to talk for you, right. to be finishing your sentences, right. filling in all these words. Fill the blanks. Yeah, right. it, that's really not what, you, even right. though that person wants to help and right. that person thinks he or she is right. doing you a service, right. it's really a disservice. Right, it's a disservice. Yeah. They right. really need to be a little more so patient. So is, is there a training that caregivers can get there's not a, a specific program out there or a protocol as to um, what you can do exactly, step by step, but there are some applications on iPads available mm -hmm. that can help the communication partner see the areas right. of weakness right. um, that the patient, the person might right. be experiencing, and that might give them more insight into how they can right. rephrase things, how they can restructure the environment, mm -hmm. um, open their eyes a little bit to what their loved one can understand mm -hmm. and can't understand right. or can express right. and cannot express. Um, those apps. They do um, require to be downloaded from right. an Apple or an Android device. Um, there's one called Constant Therapy, right. and that offers 65 different categories mm -hmm. of language tasks. So it's very broad, and it does range, so you can change the severity levels a bit, right. the difficulty, difficulty levels. Difficulty level, right. Yeah, which is really right. important. But was that for the caregiver, or is that for the, for the survivor? It's for the survivor, but I think the caregiver um, would benefit from seeing exactly what the survivor is working on. Um, because I think otherwise the caregiver might be a little bit detached from the right. program. Right. You know, so right. I think that's very important. Um, and you can purchase that on a subscription basis. basis. Right. Yeah. Do you need to get it prescribed by a physician no, or someone you can, like yourself? No, you can log online to their mm -hmm. website and subscribe. Um, there's also another company called Tactus, mm -hmm. and Tactus offers a wide range of apps that are individually downloaded. Mm -hmm. um, and this way you can 
you know, if you only have deficits in maybe one area, right. you can just download you that app that pertains to you. the one that's you. specific. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much. This oh, is very informa- very good information for people, and I think very good information for caregivers and the survivor. Thank so, you. Thank you.